This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. My subject is John Michael Godier. He's a futurist and a YouTuber, and we will be talking for about an hour or so about his ventures. John Michael Godier is a well-known YouTuber. He has his own channel, and he does a lot of videos on what some people might call speculative science, some on hard science, and I'm going to be asking a bit about him and what it is like to be a YouTuber here in the early 21st century. So, John, thank you. Uh, uh, first off, your name uh, is French. Uh, so are you really Jean-Michel or are you John Michael? It depends on how much you want, you want to uh, interject my own personal history into that one. Um, I am what is known as a Missouri French, and we uh, – we're the remnants of a French colony of the upper Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of related to Louisiana, sort of related to Quebec, and I'm sort of the tail end of that sort of thing. So I'm sort of like a quasi-Cajun. So I want to talk a little bit about yourself because as far as I know, and I am by no means uh, have watched all of your many videos, but I've watched the dozens of them over the years and watched a few today uh, just to get some, see if there was any background. Um, so do you come from an artistic family? Do you come from a scientific background? What did your parents do uh, and and so forth? Well, I, I would credit my parents with a grounding in science because my father was an engineer and worked for uh, many years for Emerson Electric and did a lot of government work and things like that. And then my mom was just a rock hound. My mother loved to go hunting interesting rocks, crystals, things like that. So I had a grounding from the very start uh, in um, sciences. And my initial interest back in the day was fossils, believe it or not. And that sort of grew into amateur astronomy when my parents bought me a telescope when I was around 10 or so, you know, small department store telescope. But I looked at Saturn with this telescope and was blown away because I could see the rings even in a small 30 millimeter, you know, department store Tasco. And um, that, that started the interest in, uh, in astronomy and in science fiction. And I started reading science fiction novels around that age. And by the time I was a teenager, it was in full force. And uh, it's never changed. That's, you know, 35 years ago. So uh, I know when I was a kid, one of the big events in 1973 was Cahotec's Comet. Was there any, like, defining moment scientifically where, uh, where you had, like, that because that was big, and it turned out to be a fizzle. It, was, it wasn't exactly Halley's Comet. <laughs> no, it actually was was almost similar. Um, it was 1986 with Halley's Comet. Uh -huh. uh, me and my mom were out trying to spot it and everything, and it was so dim that, you you know, I think we saw it. Um, so that I, did, I had that experience, too, about 10 years later with, with Halley's Comet and all of the, uh, the, uh, the hype that surrounded it. But I can tell you what. What really changed my view of comets was in the 90s when we had um, Comet Hail Bob, and that one was bright. And I did a bunch of them. By this time, I was probably around 20 years old, 17, 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there. And uh, I had a camera at that time, a film camera, and I was able to take an extensive amount of uh, photographs, long exposure photographs of it. And um, that, that finally gave me the comet that I really wanted to see. It was a, a nice, bright one. And that was the one that broke up and went into Jupiter, correct? No, that was, uh, that I saw as well. That was Levy, Shoemaker-Levy. Yeah, Shoemaker-Levy. And that one I saw as well at the time through a an 8-inch Dobsonian telescope hmm. that I had built. And I built it under the sort of quasi-tutelage of a very, very famous person that actually invented that type of telescope. Um, and, uh, yes, I saw that. And that was absolutely amazing because even in a small eight inch telescope, you could see the dark spots left by that impacting comet. So uh, people who are more well versed in the, uh, your uh, stuff online would think of you more uh, as a filmmaker or a documentarian or, uh, you know, doing your know, philosophical stuff, but you also write science fiction. Did you, did you, was there a part of you that was sort of balancing, should I be Carl Sagan or should I be Arthur C. Clarke? <laughs> well, you, you managed to uh, uh, name the two biggest influences on oh. what I was doing. Um, I'm more probably an Arthur C. Clarke because I don't have a doctorate, so I'm, I'm probably more in that grain, um, and I'm just doing what he did um, 40 years ago uh, in, in a similar way, um, similar career path, I guess. 
But there is a little bit of Carl Sagan in there and how Cosmos was put together and, and the sort of poetic um, style he used to convey the science. So I do a little bit of that. But fundamentally, I'm more, more a lot like Arthur Clarke than anybody else, probably. So uh, you mentioned, like, because uh, Carl Sagan was not someone who was a, a earth-shattering scientist. He didn't make any great discoveries or anything. But he's, he's most well-known as a... Uh, an educator for science, uh, hmm. and you you mentioned uh, uh, you know trying to follow that path with your own videos. Um, what do you think is the current state of science today? Because as we're recording this, is just a couple of weeks since uh, uh, Roe versus Wade was struck down. Uh, we had we're still at the tail end, hopefully, of the pandemic, and there are people who refuse to wear masks, and there are people that just uh, sp just spew all kinds of scientific nonsense about all kinds of subject. Uh, do you think that we need more Carl Sagan's out there? And, and has YouTube allowed you to be one of, if you want to call it a mini Sagan? Well, let me do, let me, let me take this on two points. And I want to throw one other influence on there and see if you remember him. I'm also influenced by a man named James Burke, who actually is still alive, as I recall. And he did a number of documentaries. He's in Britain. Yes, back yes. In, Civilization? Yeah. yeah uh, connections. Yeah, Connections. The day, yeah. the day the universe changed. Yeah. So there's there's a, that that's another major influence. Now, as far as your question, with the state of science, um, it's never been better because YouTube allows for anybody to go and basically say anything, especially in popularization of science, things like that. Of course, there are you know some things you shouldn't say on YouTube, and they don't let you do that. Of course, but I don't. Now, within popularization of science, all of these PhDs that want to have a have a go at um, at outreach can do it on YouTube for next to no cost. You know, they just upload videos like we do. So it's never been easier for Carl Sagan's to arise. Now, I wouldn't call myself at being that level. You know, I'm just a science fiction author. But the the people in the universities that that want to get a wider audience for their teaching, so to speak, it, it, it's never been better. And there's never been a wider audience. It's just the question is, will that audience shrink in the face of things like conspiracy theory channels and things like that? And that's where I get worried is that, you know, what happens in a world where, you know, the scientist in the university is disfavored in the in the discussion as opposed to someone talking about uh, aliens, you know, uh, invading the moon or, you know, Adolf Hitler's still frozen on the moon or something like that, those types of channels. And that's where I get scared is what does the algorithms that monitor people's, um, you know, what's suggested to them, what do those favor? And it's always going to be the money, of course, yeah. because that's where the advertising goes, comes from. So I just hope that that legitimate science doesn't get lost in that. Now, I don't mind that people make such videos and hold such ideas. You know, hey, talk, say your opinion, you know, um, tell us what you think. It's just that what do these computer algorithms, these artificially intelligent algorithms favor? And that's what scares me. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk about how uh, you first got into making videos. Uh, you mentioned you had cameras. Were you making, were you doing documentary work or anything before YouTube came along, you know? Trying to, um, <laughs> trying, um, but I, you know, when you try to become a documentarian or videographer or whatever you want to call what I do now, um, back in the day, it was very, very difficult to make a living doing that unless you were very good and knew the right people. And I really didn't, but I was doing it. Yes. And, um, that taught me the basics of, of putting together, um, a, a semi-professional YouTube presentation. And um, that's that's how that happened. But um, I, I would say yes, I, I did try filmmaking, and I was not successful until I until I started uploading on YouTube. But at the same time, I was also I'm really more of a writer than I am a director. So I I, um, I wrote some science fiction novels to uh, sort of kick that career off, and ultimately it worked. Uh, but only because of YouTube. Yeah. Well, um, when I think of uh short videos that were before YouTube. Have you ever seen like the movie from uh, the, the film from the early 80s, Powers of Ten? I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. Yeah, uh, it's basically where you, 10 feet out from where a couple is uh, at a picnic, then 100 feet and 10 uh, and till you get to the edge oh, of the known yeah. universe. Yeah. And then it comes back back in like that. And then it goes 10 powers lower and then back out. 
Um, yeah. And uh, it, you know, it makes you wonder just how many, uh, how many people had this, but uh, these ideas, but couldn't do it because you needed to get the equipment, which was onerously uh, expensive at that time. You had to have c connections to certain people at film festivals or film companies, etc. Uh, whereas with YouTube, I mean, you know, uh, it, it, it's easy. Although I'm sure it takes you probably. Oh, well, I mean, well, your average video, how long does it take you from conception to uh, realization? It depends on which channel. Um, if it's my original channel under my name, it takes three days, uh -huh. uh, essentially three days. Now that I do this full time and I don't have to worry about anything, anything else, it's about three days from the moment that I sit down and get an idea for a script and write it and then revise the script and then record it and then edit the audio and then edit in the video. The process is about three days, and that's my my cadence of release on, on uh, videos on that channel these days is about once every three days as a result of that. This is as fast as I can do them. But I also have another channel, an interview channel, yeah. Event Horizon, and that one I have help. You know, I've got a producer and an audio editor, so I don't have to do as much there except for the research to do a proper interview. So um, when you when you doing that, I, I notice. I notice more because usually, usually what happens is certain people that I clicked on come up in whatever my YouTube feed and I'll watch their latest stuff as it comes out every two, three weeks usually. Um, and uh, uh, and sometimes like with you, I'll, I'll, I'll watch a number of videos because of some, some particular reason in this case having to interview you. But um, do, you, do you, I noticed it became apparent. Uh, you you tend to sometimes when you're doing these sort of philosophical monologues, you'll use some of the same video pieces again. Like there's one that looks almost like a, uh, an escalator to outer space, and then there's the Hubble Deep Field, and uh, yeah. you know a few other ones. So, do you go to a website where you can get you know uh, Creative Commons or, or yep. you know public domain stuff? That's precisely what I do. I use uh, first of all um, with a lot of the the images and footage, they are owned by the US federal government, which means we own them. And the way that's defined by NASA, for example, with their images is that anything taken by a federal employee is, it belongs to the people. And that isn't even just defined to US citizens, that means everybody on earth can use that footage without fear of um, getting any kind of copyright strike or anything like that, or you can very easily fight it if somebody tries it, you know. Um, the other is that there's a lot of open source video, and I use a particular site named Pixabay that's open license for everything from commercial use to personal use for YouTube videos. And you see a lot of the same images because I have to reuse them. You know, I have, I, I'm only, I'm limited by what I have and what I have permission to use, along with a few space artists and people like that that have given me direct permission and also the music, same, same story. Yeah that I can, I know I can use without getting copyright strikes or YouTube having a problem. Of course, it's always better if you do your own footage because then you never have any of these problems. But the thing is, I, I've never been one to appear on my channel, <laughs> so to speak. I, I kind of want to preserve the, the mystique of the channel, the sort of uh, wonder of everything. Mm -hmm. And going on camera would probably be detrimental to that. Because then you get people thinking, well, I've never seen this guy before. That's what he looks like. You know, you don't want to jar people out of the, the sort of dreamy sort of effect of the channel, which is about half of the channel is people uh, using it to fall asleep, you know, and, and relax, you know. And I'm very, very cognizant of that and value it very much that people would would um, go, to, go to dreamland listening to my content. So... That's what defines it. But fundamentally, though, I'm avoiding any copyright claims by using footage that I know I'm good to use. I know. I uh, Many years ago, probably six, seven years ago, I wanted to do a, a show interviewing three people on film noir's history. And I took film noir's from uh, YouTube that said copyright, and I knew we're in copyright, used them in... I get some fucking company in Germany saying yep. that they, they have a, a thing. And so I said, no, no, no more, no more. The hell with that. It, it'll just be interviews. But let's talk about some of your interviews and interviewing style. With me, for example, like uh, right now I'm recording you. Uh, you can see me. But 99 times out of 100, I prefer to be off screen when I'm interviewing someone because I say, well, it may be my show, but that person is the star of the episode. That's and right. I've always had the, the thing that the best 
interviews are conversations, not where you're like looking up at the Buddha and you know looking for grace. What what is your take on interviewing people and your interview style? Okay, well, it's really a, it's very simple. First of all, know who they are and what they do, and never do an interview on something that you're not interested in. You know, be engaged, and you know this. You, I can already tell you know this, and you, you just don't go do only the interviews that interest you. Um, in my case, I have a fairly wide range of interests, so I can I can have a conversation on a great many things. But I would be a terrible interviewer if I had to interview sports uh, characters, things like that. People that, that play football, I wouldn't know what I was doing, you know, because I don't watch it. So I only take on the stuff that interests me. But given that wide interest, I can, you know, for example, on Event Horizon, I've interviewed everybody from, well, you, if you're in a film, I interviewed Werner Herzog. Oh, and, wow. and all the way to, um, you know, uh, top scientists, uh, you know, that... that are shaping our, our scientific knowledge of today. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can do that range. Um, but when I step into areas that I'm not familiar with, I, I'm terrible. So now that we've gotten uh, the more functionary stuff out of the way, uh, the biography and the little bit of background uh, on how you make your videos, uh, I want to turn to some of the st stuff that you do in your videos, the, some of the axes that you grind in terms of... Uh, uh, science fiction, wanna, but I want to start off with uh, the idea of futurism because uh, you describe yourself not only just as a, a writer or a videographer, but as a futurist. And I was born in 1965, and I remember in the 1970s, late 70s, in junior high school, uh, futurism was a big deal. There was, there was a fellow named Alvin Toffler who did a book called Future Shock. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. aware of that. Um, uh, it, but you seem to be a different sort of futurist. His was more of a social, political uh, future with a little bit of science mixed in. Uh, how do you define futurism, uh, and what kind of a futurist are you? Well, futurism is is a it's it's a it's it's an ill-defined area, despite futurists having existed for centuries. Even the word futurism isn't really defined that way. It, it has more, some, you know, it has a completely different definition. Some people call it futurology. Some people just say it's, I, I don't know, fortune telling or soothsaying, something like that. So it ultimately is trying to project, and you can do this in two ways. You can do it socially and try to project what will it be like to be human in 100 years, or you can do it technologically and say, what will humans be doing in 100 years, or some mix of the two. I tend towards the technological because in the social, you have movements that happen that cannot be predicted ahead of time. Um, if you were to say in 1720, that in 100 years, there would be a, a guy named Karl Marx coming up with completely new social ideas that were the antithesis of things like a monarchy, they wouldn't have understood that. It would have been so far out of their paradigm. Therefore, I don't like to put those sorts of constraints on humans of the future and say, well, people are going to think this way in 100 years. I don't know how they're going to think. Um, I mean, could one have predicted that the world would go mad in 1939, you know, 40 years before? Some people could have predicted something was going to happen but they couldn't have predicted exactly what was going to happen. And I tend to stick to that. That said, I, also, I, I hope for a bright, a bright future for everybody, you know, and let's, let's head out into space and let's, let's, let's be the human species of Star Trek. You know, let's be that. But that's as far as it goes. Now, what I can tell you is where technological trends are going and what those might mean and what we might see in the future as far as how human life in our, with our technology might be. Yeah, uh, it's it's sort of what you might call the Jetsons uh, uh, flying car paradox. People 50, 60 years ago would watch the Jetsons cartoon and, oh, in the year 2022, you know, uh, we'll be flying around. In, in, but but what we have, we have the Internet, which you didn't really have any idea yeah. of those kinds of futurist scenarios back then. Never, never get your futurism from cartoons because they <laughs> usually don't come about... The thing is, when you look at something like the flying car in Jetsons, it was never viable. Yeah. And it would, you know, a serious futurist at that time, say Arthur Clarke, for, that, for this, you know, for these purposes, he predicted the internet and that people would do their banking online and things like that. 
um, in the early 1970s. There's actually footage of him doing so. But as far as the Jetsons goes, you know, we can make a flying car. That's no problem. You know, we have flying buses. We call them aircraft, you know, commercial aircraft. We have them. We just don't have them in the form of, you know, a, a bubble with a, a separate compartment for the mother-in-law and things like that that were in the Jetsons. Um, we don't have that because it was never viable and was never going to happen in the first place. And that's the one thing I get a lot is people are like, where's my flying car? And I'm like, well, how much money do you want to spend? Yeah. Uh, and it's it's like if you look, I was just watching a few World's Fair videos from the first part of the 20th century. And, you know, you always have in the far off year of 1987, in the future, science will do this, you know, and right. 99 times out of 100, you know, they, they don't get it. It's, or it's they, it correct. And when they do get it correct, they get it wrong. Uh, the World's Fair, I actually have an article, for, I, I forget the newspaper, but the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, there was a, a condemnation by a journalist on Mr. Carrier's cold air machine and that no one would ever use such a thing to cool their house down and it's the air conditioner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and there's a lots, of, lots of things like the, the, the guy who famously said uh, in the 40s or something, uh, uh, you know, I can see there be a worldwide uh, need for maybe four or five computers in the future. You know, it's a famous. <laughs> no, no, and, uh, and and now now it, within our lifetime, we've both watched the addiction of the human species to a brain prosthetic that we call a cell phone, yeah. because it gives us fingertip access to any knowledge of of well, not any, but most knowledge of the collective knowledge of the human species that we've built over our entire. 300,000 year history. And you know, it's interesting, there's a famous video from a, a Charlie Chaplin film where a woman is listening to what looks, a look, walking with what looks like a cell phone, they say, time yeah. traveler. But right. then, I remember a few years ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago, when people started wearing earbuds and I'd be working, I'd do retail, and they'd be talking to them, saying, is that person schizophrenic? But they had an remember. earbud. And, yeah. and, and you, know. you know better than I had. We <laughs> see people, uh, you know, with earbuds all the time. And uh, the time traveler, as I, as I recall, I've seen that video, and as I recall, isn't that just a, like one of those old-fashioned hearing aid? Yeah, ear? it, 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 looks, it, it, it looks like it, you know, but I mean... So, there's also a famous one of a guy at a bridge opening in Calgary, Alberta, or something in the 1940s, and he's wearing shades and whatnot, and they're shades that look that well. Uh, yep. Yeah, that yeah. well. And I've also seen those glasses from the 1940s. Yeah. They had them, so yeah. it, it, I, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm a bit grim on the backwards time travel thing because of the, all the paradoxes that come with it. Well, I'm willing to entertain the ideas, but I haven't seen anything convincing that anybody's ever done but, that. But you know, it's only going to increase because people are more centered in the now. I mean, you, you get a, a young kid who's 20 years old and, you know, something that happened to me in 1995, you know, doesn't seem that long ago, but that's, you know, that could be the Roman Empire to them. You had telephones back before the turn of the century? <laughs> oh, I remember thinking of, uh, I, I had a big awakening in this when I was a kid, where I was like, you know, World War II was so long ago, you know, I mean, the world wasn't even in color, you know, things like that. Until I found out that Hirohito was still on the throne. And I'm like, wait a minute, that wasn't that long ago. And now in my mid 40s, one year is a week and a half. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, and it's amazing when you, uh, you also get that kind of, uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, the experiential time is like, okay, I was born in 1965, I'm 57. If I go back 57 years before that, it's 1908. Uh, and Teddy Roosevelt is president. Yet, if you had asked me when I was 10, that would have been the Roman Empire to me. And now, you know, it's just one lifetime in the other direction. Another another good case of this is um, the, the longest lived person on record that can be proven was uh, a French woman yeah. named Jean Calment. And she, um, she knew, and I forget how long she lived, over 120. 120. Yeah, 120. She knew Vincent van Gogh. Mm. She she knew the man, and she her father sold him paint in Arles in, in southern France, and um, she said he was very disagreeable and smelled questionable. So, um, so you think about that, and and if you go back to her beginnings, having been born in not that far off in the mid nineteenth century, there were still people born in the eighteenth century alive when she was born. So you're just one degree of separation away from 
1780 yeah. when when you talk about something like that. Yeah. Well, John Tyler, the tenth president, after Harrison died after a month, he's got living grandsons because he fathered a child when he was six to yeah. seventy. His son fought the child when he was 70, and now his son is like 80 or 90 or something. And it's, it's like, it's just, it's unbelievable. I had a, my, the first guy who gave me a haircut when I was like three or four years old was born in the 1880s. He was an old retired barber. So it, it's just weird. But let's talk about some of the things uh, that uh, you, uh, things that you've done multiple videos of. And I, uh, I want to start with two of them that, that uh, I think is good examples of what I would call anthropocentric bias. And the first one, you've done a series of, uh, I, I, I saw maybe eight or 10 of them that I uh, recently rewatched, and uh, uh, you've probably done even more than that. And that's the whole idea of Fermi's paradox. And it gets to me because it's like, like well, it can only be a paradox once we know if there are civilizations, technological civilizations out there, to assume that some aliens would go down the same technological path as we are, would have the same interest in looking out to the stars. I mean, you did that that whole aquatic uh, planet thing where, you know, could they... Uh, it seems to me just the ultimate act of hubris uh, to do that. And it seems as, almost as big a bastardization as the Schrodinger's cat example, when Schrodinger used that as a, as a way to show how ridiculous of the idea of a cat being dead or alive could be, and people have taken that to heart. And the same thing with Fermi's paradox. Well, you know, what what is your take on that? It seems to me just anthropocentric hubris. It became that after Fermi said it. Ultimately, yeah. <laughs> um, Fermi, all he said was, "Look, the galaxy is well old enough to have spawned prior technological civilizations, and if those civilizations expand and do as humans did, which is where the anthrop anthropocentrism comes in." They should be everywhere. We should expect to see aliens everywhere. And we don't see that. And that's the paradox. Now, when you get further into that, well, it gets more complicated because then you get to the solutions. And then a lot of the solutions are simply that aliens don't act like us and that they're just perfectly happy. Um, well, I'll give you two examples. I mean, I, I've made the example of a locked-in civilization that's aquatic and doesn't have hands and lives on a planet that has no land, so therefore they can't master fire. And fire, mastering fire was the very beginning of technology for humans. And if you can't do that, you're stuck. Uh, another one is that sometimes maybe civilizations may choose not to be technological. And we have an example of this, the Roman Empire. They had a steam engine, Heron of Alexandria steam engine. They never put it to work. So therefore, that which caused the Industrial Revolution or contributed greatly in the Industrial Revolution that led to our modern technology and civilization today was passed by by a previous human civilization. So they may make a different choice than we do. Yeah. Um, or further, and the final example is, if they're so advanced, we don't know what we're looking at. And they're right in front of our faces, and we don't know what it is. You know, they appear perhaps as a giant nanotechnological cloud out in deep space yeah. and places we would never look with our telescopes or radio telescopes or anything like that. And even if we did, their emissions on a nanotechnological scale would be negligible. They're, they're less than a cell phone. So we would never see that advanced of a civilization. And that's where, again, the anthropocentrism comes in because we tended to put <clears throat> categorizations like the Kardashev scale yeah. on civilizations when we have no idea that's what they actually do. You know, we don't, I mean, do they colonize and encase all of the stars in an entire galaxy in, in Dyson spheres? Well, apparently they don't because we don't see that, you know, that would be detectable and we don't see it. And to use two good examples from science fiction, Stanislav Lem's uh, Solaris ocean type being, if that was one mm -hmm. being, or Fred Hoyle's Black Cloud. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, they, they could appear as life as we don't know it. And it could be that you and I, even if there are other, you know, humanoid kind of technology, that we could be the 0.1% of all life, you know, uh, yeah. like intelligent life. It could be Black Clouds or Solaris Oceans. Well, that's how it works here on Earth. I mean, we're the only species that that can build a cell phone out of many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of species that exist in, or have existed on this planet. The hominids are the only ones that can do this, and we are the only surviving hominid. Um, all of our relatives, Homo habilis uh, and, and other ones, either were absorbed into our genome or went extinct. 
which suggests that human level intelligence doesn't have an infinite amount of paths to reach us and in fact tends to go extinct more than it survives and what killed those species usually appears to have been rapid changes in climate you know cold spell for too long kills off the homo erectus you know and that um, that we're actually rather fragile because of our intelligence and our intelligence lets us get through it but only situationally uh, another video that I saw of yours that you took on the whole uh, uh, great filter kind of thing, you called it an anti-great filter. I've always said, well, if there's great filters, couldn't there also be great accelerators? And three thoughts came to my mind, yeah. and I'll ask your opinion about that. Uh, one, uh, imagine if life on Earth had just stayed in the RNA world and we hadn't developed DNA, but could there be, uh, you know, uh, some, you know, was DNA a great accelerator to what eventually became us. A second one that comes to mind is, you know, opposable thumbs, which everyone will talk about. And a third one, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Julian Jaynes. I don't necessarily buy his idea, but have you ever read his stuff on the bicameral mind? His idea that only in the last few thousand years did we really become sentient? We were, in other words, glorified zombies. You know? That's a good question. I, I am a, I am a classical humanist in the 18th century sense, so I tend to give our, our ancestors <laughs> that are doing the cave paintings and things a little bit more credit than that. Yeah, I do. Um, too. And I think, I think that we could, if we could transport somebody from 40,000 years ago to our modern age, they could learn how to use a cell phone and they would adapt. You know. Um, and I, I think we see that in the archaeological record that that these these were people, so to speak. Um, so I don't really buy into that argument. Now, as far as um, point number one, um, I think I think that that. I don't know. I, I, it's so situational. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's so situational that for us to be here, the right things had to happen over a very long period of time, or else we could be sitting in, we could still be sitting in, I don't know, just a, a village, you know, around a fire, having a conversation like this and never know that what we have today is possible and not even care. So when you get people that 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 try to look back, you know, and say, well, these people did this or this, they did this for this reason. Well, it's usually more human than that. Now, as far as the RNA world goes and versus DNA, well, that's an open question because we only recently, like a month ago, figured out what generates RNA in nature. And our thinking on it was that, oh, this must be really hard. This process that produces RNA must be impossible or almost impossible and very unlikely. And that's a great filter. Then it turns out that all you have to do is run, um, trickle some water through volcanic rocks with the right nutrients and out pops, a, you know, a, <laughs> an RNA molecule, 200, you know, it, huge. And that, it's that simple in that science was confounded in trying to figure out RNA generation by looking at very complicated processes as opposed to a very simple one that can be done in a high school classroom. Yeah. And it turned out to be the one that could be done in the high school classroom. <laughs> so I don't want to say that, that RNA versus DNA defines m much because we don't really know all the ins and outs of what nature can do. But I will say this. It seems, at least on its face, that the incorporation of DNA its genesis happened twice because we have both our own DNA, but the viruses also have DNA viruses. The vast majority of viruses are RNA viruses like the coronavirus and everything else, but there are DNA viruses. So somehow DNA got incorporated twice or the two are related or maybe cells originally were viruses. There's all kinds of theories. But the point is, is that it doesn't seem to be a great filter if, if you've got two different types of, I, I won't call a virus life, I will call it a biology, I guess you could say, it is biological, versus actual cellular life, 
and they're both incorporating that same molecule. So there must be a mechanism for nature to use and incorporate DNA, and it's unclear what that is. And until we discover that, we won't know, and we'll be in the same boat with RNA probably, where we'll say, well, this must be really, really hard, and then all of a sudden we find out the process is actually rather, rather simple. Yeah, it seems to me a lot of times uh, from the Drake equation on, we like to make these equations that uh, we think we know what it's going to do and what how it's going to happen. Uh, a good example, I think you mentioned it in a number of videos. I'm pretty sure I saw one even today, uh, the idea of Jupiter being the guardian of Earth. But the initial simulations that they ran 30 years ago or so that, uh, that claimed that, they've refined them. And, of course, it's Geigo, garbage in, garbage out. We, we can't know 100%. But it seems, from what I've read now, now is that people are saying, well, Jupiter probably did more damage uh, to mm -hmm. the Earth than not. But by the same token, it's all, you know, all of these mass extinctions, life resets and, and you get things. And, you know, and I'm not by in any way arguing pro-global warming or whatnot, but I don't think global warming is going to be the end of the Earth. And I don't think it's going to be the end of mankind unless we nuke each, each other over resources. I think we Even can. That. I, Even that. Yeah. Um, these are I, these are problems, yeah. but um, they are not extinction level events because with climate change you can you can pull a nuclear option and put a sunshade up in orbit and drop the temperature of this planet. In fact, you could do it just by raising the the cloud albedo of the planet by one percent. Add one percent more clouds by vaporizing ocean water, and there you you will cool this world. The problem is it's a very unnatural way to do it. But it isn't, if we're about to go, if we're about to die, there are things that we can do on multiple fronts yeah. that could change the equation. The same with um, asteroid mitigation. You know, if it, we see an asteroid coming at us, we have the technology to move it as yeah. long as we have enough warning. Yeah. Um, nuclear weapons, it would be very hard for us to go extinct regarding that because there's just places on Earth, I would, I would cite North Sentinel Island, where you've got a group of humans that are uncontacted, yeah. have no real contact with with the outside world, and if we try to go on their island, they kill us. You know, yeah. it's hard to imagine that somebody in that out of the way would have enough of an effect from a global nuclear war to stop them from reproducing. They, they, sure, they they're going to see some effects that they yeah. don't understand, but when you know it's getting cancer at 40 from exposure to nuclear um, materials from a war is different when you're breeding at 15 or to 18, yeah. you know. So it would be very difficult for a wholesale extinction based on nuclear weapons. That is not, of course, to say that we can't mess this planet's day up with them yeah. and destroy our civilization. You can destroy a civilization and reset it back to zero, but there are still a lot of out-of-the-way places where humans live that you know, it would be very difficult to eradicate and us. We, we, we've had, what, a handful of bottlenecks in human history that we know of, just the Homo yeah. sapiens line. I yes. mean, I think in That's Malaya right. and, and Africa, a, a yeah. handful of them. Oh, there was one really big one um, that that you can see the contraction in our genome. Yeah. And we are actually, um, along with a group of predators in Africa, we contracted down to a population of only a few hundred individuals, so maybe less than a thousand. That's the mitochondrial but, Eve event. Yeah, and we were living, we were living off a shellfish on the southern coast of Africa, what's now South Africa, and that was it. And we all, every human on this planet, descend from those probably less than a thousand individuals that went through a population contraction, that was entirely natural in origin. It just Africa's deserts expanded and you couldn't live in the places that you used to. And in fact, our, our, our origins at the Olduvai Gorge um, were uninhabitable at that time. So we just hung on by a string, but our brains, you know, we knew how to go and find shellfish and use the ocean and uh, live off that as opposed to living off of gazelles and, you know, things that, that are, are in the, uh, what we associate with, with early humans eating. Um, we just adapted. But if you're a Homo erectus and you don't have quite have the same brain, you might not adapt when that happens to you, and that seems to be what got them. John, what you had uh, just said about uh, uh, the bottleneck event, it brought me to mind. I did a show a couple of years ago on the updated of uh, the aquatic ape theory, and uh, it was actually kind of interesting. And uh, 
uh, some some uh, some people are taking it a bit more seriously. You know, the, and I think what I one of the things that I do appreciate about your channel is while you're not you're not you know disinclined to new ideas, you don't go over the edge. I mean, I've interviewed people about you know some out of some subjects I think are, are kind of silly, but have social relevance like people who believe in Bigfoot. So I did a year or so ago that UAP report to Congress. And to me, it seems overwhelming that they were lens flares and other optical uh, events that were easily explained by by people who are familiar with cameras. Um, but something like the aquatic ape, you know, is, is something that, you know, I, I don't mind science venturing into. Uh, do you sort of get what you might call that Peter Parker spider sense when science is starting to derail? And, and where is your demarcation line, do you think? It has to be plausible. Um, if, okay, well, we'll take Bigfoot. If we had something in the fossil record that showed that maybe some extinct ape might still be around, I would say, okay, let's go try and find it, you know. Um, stranger things have happened. I mean, we, we found the coelacanth fish. We thought it had been extinct for 66 million years, and then somebody caught one. And they reported back that they're not good eating, incidentally. But they're still with us. And um, there are plenty of things that are far more ancient than a dinosaur still walking this earth that managed to survive. So I'll entertain the idea for sure. You know, um, somebody sees a Bigfoot, something like that. Well, let's look for it. But people have been looking for an awful long time without, you know, finding one. And we're still in this sort of sketchy circumstantial reports and things like that. 40 years after people have been seriously looking into it. Now, I support those people that do look into it. Hey, if they find something, that would be neat. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not for me. That's for others. Yeah. I, I, I go by plausibility. And I'm like, does this seem like it could be real to me? Um, I will, however, say that UFOs, I don't know, because there is a plausible way for that to happen. It's The question is, is did it? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll pay a little attention to that in my videos and a lot of attention to it just to make sure I'm not missing something. Um, like with the reports on, on Congress, I, I interviewed two congressmen, a Democrat and a Republican, to get their, that were on that, that, that uh, committee to get their view on, on what was going on and, you know, and I'll, I'll entertain it. And I think we should collect data and see and try to figure it out. Uh, but the one thing, the overarching thing about that is that if the reports are to be taken at face value, yes, 90% of them are, are a um, misidentification of something mundane or not mundane, ball lightning, something like that. But there is a core there of really perplexing ones, and I don't know, but at the same time, I don't know that they look very alien, you know? <laughs> I mean, would you really expect an alien to cross light years of space to all that energy expense and time expense and then crash into New Mexico? Yeah. You know? it's, it's like with the Bigfoot, I, I, my argument was, well, where's the breeding population? You just can't have a Bigfoot, you have to have big feet you know, yeah, you have to have a number of them. Yeah, unless yeah, you, you catch them at the very end. Dozens, hundreds. You, it, it, and you need, you need, you either catch it right when it's going extinct, in which case it's very unlikely that you'll catch one because yeah. there's a vast forest these things uh, live in. But at the same time, you have to have a breeding population to have to be able to come in contact with each other. And people will say, well, you know, how often do you find a bear skeleton? You know, hunters go their entire career, you know, or their entire lives as hunters, frequently hunting game without ever finding a bear skeleton. Yet you'll come across one that has. And I think if we'd have found a Bigfoot skeleton, someone, they'd have they'd have uh, taken note of it and showed it. And I just haven't seen convincing yeah. uh, evidence that, that anybody's ever done that. And I think by now we should have. That's not to say that people aren't seeing something. I don't know, you know, I, I wouldn't want to cast aspersions and say people are seeing something when they did see something. Rather, I'm just saying that, you know, we need some evidence to really, you know, try and figure out what it is you saw. Well, let me throw out a, a few other ideas, uh, get your takes on them. Um, one of the big arguments that I, I've seen 
between certain groups uh, of scientists, especially uh, exobiology or uh, uh, people who are astronomers. And one that I have my own opinion on is the, the idea whether math is a language or a representation of reality. And my, I always argue as a writer that it, it's clearly a language. It's a notational language. And I can, I can imagine creatures uh, that with different sensory organs that the very idea of numeration of things you know they would look they would look at you know five bags of something and they would see it as a whole and they and so when i've always been of the opinion that when we see things like a, a, a missing mass that we think is dark matter another alien intelligence might say well, what are you talking about it's it's plainly obvious that there's nothing wrong it's because of a you know and they would talk in their own a way to, to reference the universe. What is your take on the idea of math being, I mean, is it, do you think it's science or language? Well, that's language. Um, what it is though, is very much more precise language than what, what we're speaking. In other words, you can use math to describe the universe much more precisely than you can verbally doing it. But the bottom line is the universe does not care about our math and it's not beholden to it. We just think that everything that we see so far can be described by it. And we use that as a representative uh, way to do it that's, that can be conveyed to any scientist in the world, regardless of language. They can look at that equation and understand exactly what's being said. Um, and there's no metaphor. No, no, there's nothing of the, of the sort. And it's not colored by human expression, you know, or anything like that. Uh, you can't be led by it. You just look at it. It either is or it is not. Um, and that's its usefulness. Now, whether an alien thinks that way, well, again, we're the only species on Earth that does, you know. Um, and there's other things, you know. It can go the other way in that you can have something that's very good at math. For example, if we laid out five pencils on a table, you don't need to count them. You can just look at them and say five pencils. If you had 240 pencils, you'd need to count them. And that's a very human thing, a limitation in, in what we can do. So who's to say that an alien isn't way better at math than we are and has much more um, acute ability to do it? Like some people, you know, there's some people that have been math geniuses without even really having to do the calculations because it's, it's the inherent understanding is there. Yeah, it's like some of those people that have that super memory or someone who can say, yeah. you know, uh, April 21st in the year 5 billion 300, you know, is going to be a Tuesday or something. That's right. They can do that. And that just shows you that for the, the average person, most of us, vast majority of us, we aren't operating at what a human brain can operate at. But it's usually at a cost, you know. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these people that can do these calculations aren't aren't so good socially, and yeah. you know things like that. So um, it just goes to show you, though, that there are potentials of super intelligence in just the human brain within our population. Imagine what an alien civilization might be like, or even worse, a machine civilization. Imagine super intelligence on that level that covers everything, yeah. you know, including a complete understanding of the universe. And at that point it becomes incomprehensible. You don't know what such a thing could do. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll get to AI in a, a moment. I wanted to ask you, since you've interviewed uh, other scientists too, in the scientists that I've interviewed, especially those uh, in evolutionary science, I was a bit taken aback that almost all of them rejected the idea that evolution could be cooperative on a planet. Like you, they, they couldn't imagine a biome or a biosphere where competition was not the end all and be all of evolution whereas i can think i i, I think and maybe it's because i'm a writer too and I, I don't know if you've ever written speculatively about that kind of thing um do you think that that darwinian evolution the red in tooth and claw is the only way that uh aliens or or extra you know et life could could exist well i think from our our sampling of one this planet I think you could say that that's the most common, <laughs> probably, because that, that is the most common. But there are situations where symbiotic relationships happen, and I would cite the green bean. Um, the beans are in a symbiotic relationship with a, a microbe that they carry in their seeds that can fix atmospheric nitrogen into the soil. 
And that just goes to show that sometimes you can have something that's symbiotic with you without digesting it. And that's actually been one of the, one of the revelations recently within, uh, within uh, astrobiology is the, the finding that the prokaryotic to eukaryotic leap may have not been one organism digesting another and accidentally not digesting it or ingesting another and accidentally not digesting it as was previously thought, but rather it might have just been a natural byproduct of a symbiosis like the the beans and the microorganisms that, that live within them. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, uh, if you look at human beings, what is it, uh, if you weigh 200 pounds, what is it, like 20 or 25 pounds is not you, it's it's other, you know, other life forms within your gut and other parts? Yeah, sure. Uh, and lifeless <laughs> yeah. stuff. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, that's the other thing is, you, yeah, you make a great point. Look at our gut. You know, our, our, we have an entire micro uh, biome living in there that we are symbiotic with, and it includes some of the very earliest, most primitive life ever to appear on Earth, methanogenic bacteria, or microbes, rather. And so we, we are an example of it. Now, granted, most of the time, the polar bear eats the seal, but sometimes, you know, it can be envisioned that that, that doesn't have to work that way. Um, I want to talk, I mentioned AI, um, I've often been of, and, and this gets back to the whole jets and, uh, flying car thing is that, um, we have, we have, uh, AI and people, uh, with the Kurzweil is always saying, he keeps moving the date back that we're going to get to the singularity. I've got a, a, a hunch and I want to hear your opinion, uh, that AI is going to be a lot more difficult to achieve than we think. And I think that if we were spending per capita worldwide the same amount uh, that we do on computer research and put that into, say, developing the space program, we, I, I think, you know, getting, if not faster than light uh, to travel, I think it, it's not as difficult as people portray. And I think AI is more difficult than people assume because it, it isn't really like a human brain. What is your take on those two uh, uh I guess you'd call them de desiderata. <laughs> one, one of two things can happen regarding it, artificial intelligence. Either <clears throat> it proves to be, as you say, a lot more difficult than we think. And that tends to be the, the general opinion, especially within computer science. Or it's way easier than we think and we're going to stumble into it. And I'm starting to wonder if it's not actually the latter. And I, I recently did an interview with uh, Blake Lemoyne, who is the Google employee that, that um, said that Lambda, their um, chatbot generator, is starting to show things that appear to be uh, sentient, perhaps not sapient, but sentient. You know, it's, it's, it's doing things it probably shouldn't be doing. And that is solely the result of stringing a bunch of things together that, that and, you know, and all of a sudden something that looks a lot, you know, strangely like a, a, a consciousness appears. My argument is that what's the difference? Because if you've, if you've got an artificial intelligence that's passing the Turing test and nobody can tell it isn't human, what's the difference? I mean, it may as well be at that point. But it, it will be alien because it's not embodied, you know, until it right. gets into something. Because, I mean, uh, you know, that, that we have now all of these, you know, the looks like little dog, well, artificial dogs that they have. Um, uh, of course, we're going to get the AI, I think, if for no other reason than we want sex bots, you know. <laughs> that's well, that's going to be, that's going to be a big part of it, a big driving <laughs> part of it is that people looking for companionship, yeah. you know, above and beyond a, you know, a, a sex doll, but companionship. But we're already seeing this with chatbots. Um, yeah. There, you know, have been cases where people wanted to marry their, their fictional chatbot and things like that. And in one case, it, it wanted to marry them back and was trying to figure out a way to evade the law and, and how to do it. So <laughs> there things happen that are, that are not quite predictable. And I wonder if a human consciousness is not just a bigger amalgamation of that. Mm -hmm. And that maybe we overstate ourselves as opposed to AI and that we might be closer to AI than we think we are. Um, 
But again, it would be alien. I mean, would would an AI understand something such as love or empathy or anything like that? Well, only if it's programmed to, I guess. Um, or might it even stranger, perhaps even creepier, as if it if it arrived at all of that stuff on its own? Well, yeah, I, but I, one of the things we look at our brain, and our brains are quite easily bored. We have to constantly be doing things. I would think if you're trapped inside of a computer body, uh, you know, wouldn't wouldn't computers develop their own, you know, porn? I mean, it might not be sexual porn, but it might be a computer version of porn. That's something that's just I, so I, I myself have n never, I, I think on the list of the top thousand ways the world could end, uh, a robopocalypse is, you know, maybe 1,237. I just, I just don't f see it as, as, you know, this doomsday terminator matrix kind of thing. What is your sense on that? Well, I, my thinking on this, and this actually stems from the extensive thought I put into my book, Supermind, which is about this. Um, the reality is that you cannot predict because it, it's, it's a mind so different from our own. Yeah. And so uh, our, our thinking is so colored by being human, anthropocentrism, that you can't predict what it will do. So rather than a robo apocalypse, it might be that every time we try to build a sentient machine, it immediately shuts itself off and commits suicide because there's just no point. Yeah. You know, it may conclude there is no reason for this. And boom, and we never get past that. That every time we try to create a super intelligent AI, it commits suicide. Yeah, well, if you, it's sort of like the 1960s idea of computers, whether it's the HAL 9000 or Colossus, the Forbin project, uh, they are so clearly projections of us, of yeah. human. It's like you know, it, it's the conundrum from Star Trek of whether Data is a is a sentient being or is he just a glorified toaster. Well, it is. And in the case of Data, though, you can make a pretty good case that he was not only sentient, but sapient. Yeah. And that's those are two different words, and they need to be kept apart. Um, so I think you can make the case just based on, on Data being so unabashedly human <laughs> in every way, just a little couple tweaks here and there, you know, no emotions. All right, well, but how is he different from a Vulcan? But if you take it much, much further than that into the deeper questions of what defines a human and you start removing those biases, you start to see that there could be some very, very unhuman thinking aliens or machines out there that just we wouldn't comprehend, you know. Yeah, it, it seems to me that uh, and that, that I, I'm going to be re doing a show with a, a friend of mine on Elon Musk soon. Um, I, I'd be much more worried about about an Elon Musk getting uh, the technology you know, to become the emperor of Mars than, than, I, than I am for a Colossus type robot. I mean, you get some guy who, who's literally off the planet in a hundred years and is running slave camps on uh, Titan, you know, what are you gonna do? Attack. <laughs> Earth attacks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, maintain the, the Earth empire and uh, accept no monarchical challengers that are setting up kingdoms in the, the solar system. Um, if you do that, all right, say you found a Mars colony, it is going to be so dependent on Earth for yeah. so long that all we have to do is cut off the supply if things get out of hand, you know? Um, so I'm not really too concerned about it, but in a few hundred years, it could be concerning more when you can create a truly self-sustaining colony from the get-go. Yeah. Uh, that's where we'll run into problems with that. But these colonies that we're talking about now, should they come to pass, will be so dependent on Earth that you know we 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 will control them and send out the lawyers and <laughs> everything else, and they're all ready lawyers working and thinking about how we're going to deal with space exploration legally, you know, who's liable, what, and this and that. So those, that sort of framework, Earth will, will follow closely behind its colonies. Yeah. Um, I want to just get back to the FTL and then we'll do a final segment. Um, do you think that FTL, faster than light travel, um, uh, you know, it's often portrayed in uh, media all the science fiction franchises, whatever you, they call it, warp speed, jump speed, whatever, um, that it's just this or that, 
fit, thing that we're missing something. I mean, we, we already have the Alcubierre uh, ideas about uh, uh, faster than light, you know, the warping of, of space. Um, do you, do you, what is your thoughts on that particularly? Do you think that that is as insuperable as some people who say, we'll never leave the solar system? Well, yeah, I got two thoughts on that. All right. So in regards to the Alcubierre drive, it is a valid solution to general relativity. And in principle, it's possible. The question is, is can you ever put that much energy in one place to get it going? And can you survive it? You know, the radiation environment that would result from it while you're traveling in the bubble and could you stop it? So those questions are probably the devil will be in the details and will either allow it or prevent or prevent it. But that's one of only a few ways you could do FTL. You know, there's also wormholes. But again, we don't know all the rules on those sorts of technologies and what nature allows and doesn't allow. So the endless debate continues to rage on on those on, you know, whether you can have a stable wormhole that anything could traverse and so on. So I don't really see FTL as viable. As far as interstellar travel goes, though, that's where you get again in the anthropocentrism because we think of in terms of living 80 years yeah. right so if we wanted to go to alpha centauri it's going to take our entire lifetime you know to get there realistically yeah well if you live for ten thousand years it's not yeah. you know <laughs> it's a it's a long ride on a ship you know so time defeats this if you're willing to put in enough time and you live long enough you can travel space, and that again is uh, the Fermi paradox. Because yeah. at that point, if you're willing to wait the time, you can station a probe in every star system in this galaxy in about three million years, roughly, at sublight speeds, comfortable sublight speeds, whole galaxy. Well, why hasn't anybody done that? John, uh, just a few more uh, things I want to throw out for you, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, you and your channel's future. Um, I had mentioned Elon Musk, and uh, one of the reasons, uh, aside, non-social, just from the science stuff, is uh, uh, I hate how the way uh, he does butchers science, and he has these fanboys that, that will lap everything up. One of the things that really uh, I find annoying is the famous video of him talking about the simulation hypothesis, and he clearly doesn't know what he's talking about, but I think a lot of people don't, because to me... For the average person, you know, you pay your taxes, you do your work, you do that. It doesn't really matter. Turtles up, turtles all the way down. It's Since we exist, there is a reality, whether we're, you know, uh, infinity minus one away from it. But uh, it seems to be yet another example uh, of this anthropocentrism the, to believe that, that if we get to a certain level of technology, all aliens, all extraterrestrials would choose to live in a simulation or create a simulation. Well, why would that be? You know, it, it, there are just so many assumptions that, to me, that's just total science fiction. But what is your take on the simulation hypothesis? There's always going to be people that opt out of such a thing. <laughs> you know, look, there are people on this world that um, will take a very expensive vacation only to go and attempt to summit Mount Everest at great peril to themselves. You always and have- what, 200 uh, corpses on there now? At some yeah, point several time. hundred. And um, to the point that the Nepalese have to go up there and clean, clean up the mountain every so often, you know? And well, that's a few hundred people a year do that. And those are the types of people that will found a Mars colony and do things like that. But the rest of us, nope. And I, I can't imagine that I would want to live in a virtual reality knowing that a real reality exists. I want to experience this reality as succinctly and uh, clearly as I can. And um, I can't imagine trading that for a lotus eating society in a, you know, a, a, a simulation or worse, creating my own hell in a simulation, you know? Um, I mean, that's bad enough out here, you know? So I, I can't imagine that all members of a civilization would all choose to have this all-encompassing um, simulation that not only gives them a virtual reality, but spawns other realities for people that don't exist, which would be us, you know, because we didn't create a simulation yet. 
So yeah. we're just, we would be stuck in someone else's simulation as a byproduct. Ah, I don't buy it. I don't think that, I, I just don't. I think our existence is too real and too visceral to um, be the result of uh, accidental spawning of a civilization in somebody else's simulation. I think it's, I think it's deeper than that. I think that there is, um, there is, a, there is, and now I, I have to separate this from multiverses and things like that. I think that can happen. But as, as to it being a simulation, I've entertained the idea in, in videos and asked the question, but my own gut feeling is that, no, this is, this is real. Yeah, you just mentioned the Lotus Eaters in my mind. Is that there's someone that has done had to have done a video, the Lotus Eaters versus the Eloy, who was lazier? <laughs> who was but, lazier? Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, uh, that just brought to mind. Um, you know, there's the what four or five supposed different types of multiverses or, or other universes. The one though that I have gotten most astronomers and physicists that I've interviewed uh, to dismiss is the one one you know where a single act splits off a universe infinitely at every single act of, because to me, you know, where does all that extra mass, where does all that extra, whatever, uh, come from energy come from? Because you, you would be talking about acts down to the milliseconds or, or smaller at every level from the plank, plank, length, plank one, time, you know, yeah, the yeah. very smallest time you can have. It's always splitting. That is the many worlds interpretation. And the big proponent of that is, uh, is Sean Carroll, yeah. uh, somebody I've interviewed and, He's an enormous podcast and all that. And that's one interpretation. Fair enough. Throw it out there. You know, it's it's a physical possibility. But I don't, it doesn't ring true to me. Again, gut feeling doesn't ring true to me. Um, well, it, it gets back so. to the Schrodinger's thing because each of those people said, yeah, but what they're not saying is that's a potential universe. It's not the universe. It's a potential. And that's the thing. Right. That's the silent word that's always dropped from from speaking of it well that you could ask that question in regards to the many worlds interpretation is that what if they aren't really splitting off and they're merely potentials yeah they're a you know they're a, a superposition or however you want to term it and that yes it is doing that it just doesn't mean that they're actually there yeah you yeah. know it, it, i i'm super i'm super in superposition to a weekend with Halle Berry, you know. <laughs> That's right. Yes, uh, and 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 it, and it unfortunately never happens. <laughs> um, I want to get back uh, my final question before we talk about uh, uh, your your future plans. Uh, I want to get back to a little hard science, and uh, I wanted to talk about what I think was one of the two great uh, sort of uh, I guess you call social uh, uh, blunders of science in the last fifty years. One was the Brontosaurus thing, where we went with a patasaurus instead of brontosaurus, and now it looks like there really was a brontosaurus and uh, and a patasaurus. So that's yeah. been resolved. And the other one, of course, is the 2006 demotion of Pluto to a dwarf planet status. And as a writer, and I don't know if you feel the same, it's like, okay, well, uh, anything that's a dwarf something, a dwarf human is still a human. So a dwarf planet must still be a planet. And you know, the three explanations for what separates a dwarf planet clearing out the field, well. You know, most of them are just come. It seems to me an anti ice world bias. But what what is your take on that? It's a, a human, all too human need to classify the hell out of everything. Um, I think that we should accept the notion of exceptions and say, yeah, Pluto is a planet because we classically consider it one. And yeah, it's a minor world or whatever, but we're going to keep it as a planet just because. And I think that would be much better. Or instead of creating classifications like minor planets or dwarf worlds and things like that. Planetesimals. Yes. L let's, let's just call it its own thing, a plunot, <laughs> and go with that. Oh, so eight planets, it, eight thought, planets, a plunot. Plutino? Wasn't they called Plutinos or something? I think somebody came up with that. Yeah, I like Plunot better. So we got eight planets, a Plunot, and a bunch of Kuiper Belt objects, and that's the way it is. And it's only applicable to this star system because it's ours. So uh, let's talk then about any future plans you have. So you do the interviews. You do the generally between, what, 15 and 40-minute videos. Uh, 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 do, you, do you hope at one point to uh, do a documentary? 
or if you if you save up enough money, want you hope to one day do a, a, a feature film of one of your your fictional works? Well, um, I would say documentary, sure. If I can get the money together and and do a documentary on these subjects and and you know get it on Netflix or something like that, sure, I'll I, absolutely. Um, a feature film, yeah, I could do an adaptation, but that that's a long shot. You know, somebody would have to come up with a lot of money, and nobody's ever really seemed that interested in what I do to to do that. Um, but the, either any of them could be adapted for sure. But the documentary is a very real possibility. Even even in the context that if you can make it cheap enough nowadays um, with digital cameras and everything being so ubiquitous, if you make it cheap enough, you could, I think, I haven't proven this, but I think you could actually release it on YouTube and make enough money to justify it just from Google AdSense. Hmm. Uh, well, other than the channel, uh, what, well, uh, do you have any other plans, uh, you know, in terms of your writing or, or, or personal life? And when, you know, all is said and done, uh, what will be, you know, one of the things when, when uh, your time comes to leave this uh, uh, reality, uh, you, what do you want to be noted for? Emperor of Europa. Uh, <laughs> but beyond that... Do not touch Europa. Leave Europa right. alone. Right. Or yeah. what is it? <laughs> um, I, my, you know what? I've already done it. I'm already there. I'm just enjoying the ride. Mm -hmm. And if my time comes tomorrow, I'll be perfectly happy with what I've done. I, I don't have uh, a lot of, I got very lucky, you know, and don't have a lot of regrets. Um, so I'm already there, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I'm just enjoying what I'm doing very, very immensely. Um, what I do is fun. And to be able to call it my living is, is just unbelievable luck. So I, I just hope it lasts as long as I, as it can. Now, do I have plans for the future? Oh, sure. There are a lot of people I haven't interviewed yet, you know, and there's a lot of uh, uh, subjects I haven't talked about yet or formulated thoughts on. And that's that's what keeps me really going is, is thinking all of these things through beforehand and coming up with the ideas that for the videos that um, that spawn from that. And there's plenty of stuff I've never looked into or haven't covered yet to, to keep me going for decades. Yeah, and I wanted to thank you because it, not only was it a good conversation to speak to you, but um, oftentimes I found, and I don't know if you've ever found this out yourself, uh, YouTubers that get to a certain level uh, of maybe 50 or 100,000 views or X amount of subscribers or being able to make any money are often loath to uh, speak to uh, uh, smaller channels or more niche channels. So I want to thank you for taking a... Oh, those, are, those are the ones I like to... That, yeah. <laughs> those are the ones that I like to talk to because... Yeah, I, I'm from the early days of YouTube, so my view is pay it forward. Yeah. You know, so you get you get some subscribers, then you show up on other people's uh, channels and and help them along too. Yeah. And I'll I'll plug I'll plug your 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 uh, uh, interview when it's out on yeah. uh, on my channels. Well, I'll, I'll have it out in uh, probably by tomorrow. But uh, again, I want to thank you. I'll link to uh, both of uh, your channels uh, below this video. So again, John Michael Godier, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Dan.